Hi everyone, it's Jody from Opening the Door on Private Practice Facebook group and psychosynthesis.online. So last week I talked about, um, I had a question from someone asking how to convince a client to come to us as a counsellor or psychotherapist um, when we're not able to give a Medicare rebate. And uh, one of the tips that I mentioned was around writing a blog or an FAQ page around um, educating uh, potential clients around using the Medicare system. So, um, so this, the, we, we call these third party organizations. So Medicare, insurance, EAP, um, I'm not sure who else, maybe NDIS. Um, and basically what that means is that the client uh, gets some kind of rebate or some kind of assistance through a program. So most counsellors and psychotherapists, we can uh, get insurance for some um, some clients. If they have insurance, they can get that. But it's not like the states where, you know, most people are paying health insurance and they use that then uh, for their therapy as well. So um, most people go um, private pay for counselling and psychotherapy in Australia with, with a few sessions that might be rebated through insurance. Uh, or EAP or NDIS. So this is really for people who are going into private practice um, for counselling and psychotherapy and who want to um, attract clients who pay out of pocket. So um, one of the things that I did many years ago was to write an FAQ page um, on uh, why pay for therapy. So one of the first ideas that you can do is um, write a blog. It doesn't have to have anything to do with Medicare. Uh, why pay for therapy? So um, I sort of did mine a bit of a play on the uh, L'Oreal ad um, because you're worth it. So you can do something like that for that. Um, and um, a couple of other blogs that I've wrote, I think I wrote part one and part two for that. I'll post them underneath so you can get some ideas. And then I also did one around why um, counsellors and psychotherapists and their clients are better off without Medicare. Um, I've had so many messages from people telling me, um, you know, that that comes from a very privileged position. Yes and no. I don't think Medicare provides the, um, the service that people think it does. So... Um, you know, and, and I talked about that last week around um, the, the psychologist fee is so much and the, re the rebate is so much. When you work that out, it, it almost always works out almost a similar um, range to what a counsellor and psychotherapist would charge anyway. So even going through Medicare, it's still, I think, for the privileged um, because it's for people who can afford to, um, to pay that um, gap fee. I, I don't know many people who um, cover the whole... And I think I made a mistake on my video last week saying something around um, getting the session for free. I, I don't know anyone who whoever gets that. Um, saying that, we used to go and see a family therapist down at Queenscliff Health Centre and it was covered by Medicare. But that was through an agency, so it was done slightly differently. It wasn't a private psychology appointment. Uh, and you had to have quite high needs. We're a family where we have children through foster care, so we came under the high needs for that. But most people would not fall under that anyway. Anyway, back to the blog. So uh, I'm going to give you some tips about what to put in a blog for um, maybe like an FAQ blog around um, why go private or um, the differences between, um, you know, counselling and psychology and uh, seeing using psychology services. So, look, these blogs are a little bit controversial. Um, that's always good because they usually get lots of hits. Um you know, so I, I think go for it. So the first thing you want to address is something. Let me just have a look what I've written here. You can address this in one or two blogs. Perhaps the first one, why is therapy worth paying for? So I've already talked about that. Um, and why pay for therapy versus using insurance? So some of the topics you might mention are this. Being in relationship with third parties in terms of their rules and regulations and making choices for clients. So what I mean by that is when you go through uh, Medicare or EAP or even NDIS, I suppose, um, th there'll be a set of rules and regulations that, um, that the client and the therapist will need to follow. So um, being in private pay, you are the one that makes the, the decisions for your practice. And 
um, clients then have the option of choosing someone who, um, you know, just has to follow their rules. I, I always say this to my kids around being a, um, a foster parent on the, on the way to adoption. And that's, um, I, I'm the mum, but there's a mummy above me as well, you know, and that's Department of Community Services. It's a bit like that when you pay for, um, you know, when, when you go through an EAP or a, a Medicare sort of system for, for counselling. Um, one of the benefits of choosing a counsellor and psychotherapist from, um, you know, for example, the PACFA database is that the client can choose whoever they want and they can scroll through, they can spend as much time as they like and they can choose anyone they want. Um, when you go down the uh, Medicare route or, or even the private insurance or the uh, EAP route, NDIS route, um, there's typically a list of therapists um, that, that people will be referred to. I, I think some of those you can find your own and then you get the payment from the other third party. That's slightly different. But certainly with Medicare, you know, um, I know when I go to my doctor um, for things, you know, I had a, a foot injury and um, this was the name she gave me and off I went, you know. Um, it, it's a bit like that with psychology when you go through Medicare system. So when clients don't have to go through the Medicare system, they can choose whoever they like. Um, they're not limited in their choice of therapist and, um, you know, they can choose a counsellor or a psychotherapist, obviously. Um, then there's the right for the client to choose the modality of their choice. So we know when we go through the Medicare system, we get a psychologist or we get, um, a, there's a small number of mental health social workers. Um, psychology is a medical model and social work is a social model. Um, that's great if that's who you want to go and see. And sometimes um, it's absolutely more appropriate to see this person or that person. And... A lot of the time, it's more appropriate to see a counsellor or a psychotherapist. So, um, and we each have our own modality. So I knew when I was looking for my recent therapist that I've been with for the last year and a half, two years, um, I wanted psychospiritual and I wanted somatic. And um, I had to go overseas for that because, um, you know, I'm the most highly qualified psychosynthesis therapist in Australia. There's only a couple of us. And um, so I knew that I would have to go overseas. Um, I knew I was not going to find that on a Medicare um, psychologist database. There's no way. Likewise, an art therapist, a gestalt therapist, uh, I've mentioned somatic therapist, a Jungian therapist, uh, process oriented therapist, existential therapist. You are not going to find someone on the Medicare system unless they've trained in psychology first and then gone on to do a psychotherapy training. Um, that's not how it works. It's typically, um, there's a list of uh, interventions that um, psychologists and mental health social workers um, need to use. And that's typically uh, the, the most obvious one is CBT. And then there's interpersonal therapy and a couple of others. Typically short-term solution focused. That's not how most counsellors and psychotherapists work. Um, so people, when they come to us, they get to choose whatever discipline they like. And I think that is a real benefit that we need to highlight on um, our blogs or, or however we're getting our message out there. Uh, the next one is that the client has a choice um, as to when uh, they attend therapy and when they end therapy. So, um, you know, for me, uh, I work weekly, long term. So if someone was to come to me with a Medicare rebate with a mental health um, plan, uh, through through the GP with the Medicare, they would get between three, six, ten, twenty. Uh, because I'm an eating disorder therapist, they might get forty sessions a year, which would be ideal. Um, but for the majority of people, um, they only get so many uh, sessions rebated anyway. So they're going to after after ten sessions. I mean, I, I don't know how you work, but certainly for me, most people come to me for about forty sessions a year for one, two, three, four five, six years. So um, 10 sessions is not actually a lot in terms of a rebate anyway. So the client um, has the option of staying in therapy for as long as they like when they come to us. So that I think is a real benefit. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, the other thing is wait lists and um, timeframes. So 
there's, we're all hearing about it with uh, mental health and the pandemic, uh, that wait times are three to six months for some uh, services. And, uh, you know, one of the problems, obviously, that um, is highlighted by the need for counsellors and psychotherapists to have Medicare is that um, there's 10,000 between ACA and PACFA, there's 10,000 therapists sitting there ready to go. Um, so all this rubbish about trying, you know, getting people in from overseas and letting provisional psychologists have the rebate, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, there's... And actually, that that's actually a lie because some of those would only be level one and level two with ACA, so they wouldn't be applicable to the Medicare rebate anyway, I don't believe. But we've certainly got... Um, you know, all all PACFA um, members, or the majority of PACFA members, have got that quality and level and standard of training to go right now. So I think that's about I think it's about four thousand members or something like that. Um, so what else was I going to say? Yeah, so we're ready to see people in a few weeks. I mean, uh, many of us have now got wait lists as well, uh, but it's certainly not like a three month wait list where people are being referred to, through the Medicare system. So um, there are a couple, that, that's a couple of ideas for you to put on a blog like that. Um, the other thing actually I forgot was privacy and confidentiality. So obviously, um, you know, when my husband and I were going through IVF and we, we moved home from England to Australia uh, and then we could see that IVF wasn't working and we had to go, um, we, we then chose to go down the foster to adopt uh, route to have a family. One of the things that was very obvious very early on was that we were going to be asked for a medical and it covers all sorts of things. So we were with the doctor for about two hours and put it this way, there are some things about my um, psychological history that probably are not very appealing to an adoption board. Um, so... And, and look, this goes two ways. I don't want to stigmatise any more uh, things like eating disorders, but certainly when, when an adoption board sees something like an eating disorder, which is classed as a severe psychiatric illness, I don't personally um, diagnose it like that, that then becomes very problematic along the adoption, adoption process. And it's not going to stop someone from being able to become an adoptive parent, but it's certainly... Um, it'll certainly add some hiccups along along the way and some extra interview sessions and um you know I, I just think um a lot of people are being diagnosed with things and um from the dsm that are everyday concerns um grief is being pathologized for example even eating disorders, uh, I don't agree with some of the classifications around this stuff. Uh, I'm aware that I'm a bit of a lone ranger out there on that sometimes, though. Um, I just think we need to be, clients need to be really careful about what information is being stored about them. People who want to go into the armed forces, for example. Um, and I'm not saying to dupe the system or anything like that. I just think this very medicalised um, model could be a real hindrance for some people later on in life that they haven't really thought about. So um, one of the benefits of going private is that it's private. Um, I mean, not 100%. Of course, we could get called to court. We can, all sorts of things can happen. Um, but in general, you know, um, you know, I've got a friend actually whose daughter's just started counselling and um, she's gone private. She doesn't want that on her health record and I don't blame her. So there's lots of benefits to going private pa private pay rather than through a third party system. And also things like we have to write reports and send them back to places like that. So your information starts to get shared um, in, in lots of different ways that I personally don't feel comfortable with with that. So they're just some of the tips for um, if you did want to write a blog on this topic. And also, once you've got a blog on that topic, that is something then you can send out to your mailing list or post on your Facebook page, or you can have pinned to your website, why, um, why go private um, uh, rather than, you know, um, through a third party or, I mean, you make it sound a bit sexier than that. That sounds terribly boring, but um, yeah. And then you could even email it to clients when they write and say, hi, I've got a doctor's referral. Can I come and see you under the Medicare health plan? Um, you could reply, oh, look, I stopped doing this, but you could reply and you could say, 
Hey there, thanks so much for reaching out. Um, Counselors and psychotherapists don't provide Medicare. Um, and here's a list of the reasons why. And you send them um, the blog post for them to have a read of. Uh, and we're also educating the public too then about counselling and psychotherapy. Okay, I hope that's useful. I'll post the links underneath. All right, bye.